All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this month's CSU Wellbeing Cooking Demo. We have a couple special guests with us and we have our registered dietitian, Ms. Valerie, and she's gonna introduce our other special guests. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here again. Thank you for being here. I want to thank Lachika, as always, for putting together these webinars. They don't just magically take place. There's a lot of marketing and behind the scenes work that needs to be done, so thank you very much. And also a great big thank you to Columbus State University for supporting these webinars. My name is Valerie Horton. I'm an Aramark registered dietitian, and I work with the Aramark Dining Services team providing meals to the community as well as nutrition education. This morning, I am delighted to have a co-host with me. Uh, Carol Stringer is, is joining us, who is a Fulton County Agricultural and Natural Resources agent, and she's part of the University of Georgia Extension, Cooperative Extension. The UGA Extension helps bring research-based agricultural information to the people of Georgia, connecting the dots between Georgia farmers and food producers and consumers and buyers around the state of Georgia. Carol will be taking us through the journey of a pumpkin today. One of our brightest and most popular fall foods. So we're really excited about that. We're become, we will become familiar with the life of a pumpkin, what it act, actually travels through in order to end up in a grocery store or in a farmer's market. So we can either eat it, display it, carve it, or enjoy all the goodness of it. So, I want um, to uh, welcome Carol and thank her so much for uh, volunteering to be here this morning. After she finishes with her segment, she's also gonna hang around. We're also gonna cook with pumpkin and uh, embrace some other fall recipes with a granola, um, a latte, and um, hopefully those will uh, uh, bring forth the fall right into your kitchen. So Carol, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Valerie, for that little intro. I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint. Let's see here. Share. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. I'm sorry. Okay, so as Valerie said, I am the Fulton County Agricultural and Natural Resources Agent um, here in Atlanta. My offices are actually in Sandy Springs, but um, we serve the entire county and metro area of Greater Atlanta, along with our counterparts in uh, Cobb and DeKalb. Um, so today I'm going to go ahead and talk about pumpkins for you all. So pumpkins are part of the Cusurbit family which also includes other squash, cucumbers, and melons. They have very leathery skins that protect their orange flesh and interior seeds. And they can range in colors from uh, bright orange to green, gray, white, yellow, even red. Um, and in size from just a few pounds to extremely large, up to a thousand pounds or greater. So pumpkins were originally domesticated in what is today Mexico. Um, and were cultivated throughout the Americas uh, as part of the Three Sisters agriculture, which includes corn, beans, and squash. And if you guys are not familiar with that, I encourage you to Google it. It's a very interesting sort of agricultural method. Um, and so squash could be any number of, of crops that they would have grown, including pumpkins. So they are some of the oldest domesticated crops worldwide. Some archeologists think that they could have been uh, forms of squashes, including gourds and um, I think yellow squash could have been cultivated as early as 10,000 years ago. Um, we don't exactly know for sure, of course, with the archeological records, but we do know that it was widely cultivated before any arrival of Europeans here in the Americas. So it's a very old crop um, and it's an American crop. So cultivation, pumpkins are a warm season annual, which means they, their entire life cycle happens in one year um, and they don't tolerate any cold temperatures. So in Georgia, we plant them in May for an October harvest and South Georgia may be able to plant them as late as July and still have them in time for October. 
So they need very warm days, about 80 to 130, depending on your variety, uh, days of 70 plus degree weather in order to get that pumpkin. Unfortunately, unlike some of our other crops, uh, pumpkins take up a lot of space, up to eight feet or more uh, square feet of space per pumpkin plant. So they have very large binding tendency and they will grow and grow and just sprawl everywhere all over the ground. Um, which is why they were so popular with the three sisters method because they grew all over the ground and kind of suppressed weeds around the corn and uh, beans that were growing. So pumpkins are a monoecious plant, which means they have a male and a female flower on the same plant. So it's very important to get that pollination from the male to the female flower. So in a lot of commercial pumpkin fields at the time that the plants are producing the flowers, they will bring in beehives to make ensure that that pollen gets over to the female flower. Um, so if, if that doesn't happen, they, then there will not be a pumpkin produced on that vine. But like I mentioned before, pumpkins are a very wide family group. Uh, I'm sorry, they're part of squashes, which are a very wide family group, and they have a lot of cousins and relatives and they can all readily cross pollinate. So if you grow any other kind of squash in your garden, including zucchini or yellow squash or um, butternut squash, uh, they can easily cross pollinate, which means that you should probably not save seeds unless you only grew that one pumpkin. And here in Georgia, cucurbits, including cucumbers and uh, melons as well, they face a lot of disease and insect pressure. So it's very important to rotate the crops year after year. So in a commercial production, you might have a, a field that was used for pumpkins one year and then the next year it goes to corn and then the next year it goes to beans or soybeans, something like that, because that helps break those cycles of um, insects and diseases. So pumpkins here in the United States are typically either grown to be cooked or to be carved. They're either going to go into food production or decoration. Um, so the pumpkins that we purchase, you know, you go into the grocery store and you see those huge bins of pumpkins outside the door. Those are grown specifically for carving and decorating. They typically have very poor flavor if you ever do decide to cook them. I mean, they're not horrible, but they're not as robust as a pie pumpkin would be which has a higher sugar content and smaller and just typically has more um, flesh that's a little bit softer. And they are gonna be a lot better for baking. So Illinois is the state in the United States that produces more pumpkins than anybody else. Um, and their pumpkins are primarily destined for the canned food market, which is like what you are gonna get, at, you know, with this Kroger, you're getting that pie filling pumpkin. Um, so they will go to canneries and things like that and be made into uh, for a consumer market. So other states are typically producing the decorative pumpkins that you get at the front of your Kroger store. Uh, and this is just a fun point that I wanted to put out for you all. If you've ever been to a pumpkin patch and you're, you know, you're picking out your pumpkin, those pumpkins may not have been grown in that spot. We have this idea that the pumpkins there in the, in the, um, patch are often brought in from other parts of the farm or even from other farms and then they are kind of assembled in this appealing sort of array and then people go out there and pick out their pumpkin but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were grown in that spot. So production. Okay so as I mentioned before Illinois they're the number one um, in turn for that food market. So commercially grown pumpkins destined for food they're gonna be uh, pushed into rows in the field with one, you know, a tractor, and then another tractor is gonna come along and it, they lift the pumpkins up. And as you can see in this great picture down here, they kind of pop them over into this truck and that will go to a factory where they'll be cooked and processed and then canned for commercial uh, markets. So in those instances, as you can see here, they're being shot over in this little fun cannon thing. Um, so damage to those is less important. If they're going to a decorative market, it's very important that the pumpkins you know, look beautiful and don't have big gouges in them or broken, anything like that, whereas that's less important going to the factory. So decorative pumpkins are uh, harvested by hand. 
just a lot of work. As in this top picture is actually me. Um, I once harvested pumpkins back when I lived in Kentucky years ago, and it is a lot of work and very heavy. Um, and we more or less did it the same way. We just kind of pushed them into piles, backed the truck up, and then loaded them onto the truck, but with more care than you would see for those going to the um, cannery. So worldwide, every continent except Antarctica is growing pumpkins for some capacity. Here in the US, they're primarily just a seasonal crop, just for food and decoration. Um, and other countries that are grown mostly for food or for animal feed. Uh, we all know about jack-o'-lanterns, of course, that tradition supposedly came over with the Irish and Scottish uh, who had been historically carving turnips for Halloween and they discovered, man, pumpkins are just way bigger, way easier to carve than those turnips. And so thus the, the jack-o'-lantern tradition absorbed the pumpkin. Um, and so it's even featured in pop culture throughout the U.S. Like The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is a very early 1800s short story. We've got the jack o featured in that one. Um, and I'd also just like to point out that they're not just a Halloween tradition. You know, they're a popular part of Dia de los Muertos. Um, and they cook them in different dishes there as well in Mexico. So with that, I'm going to wrap up my brief pumpkin talk. Um, if you guys have questions about pumpkins or other crops, you're welcome to ask them to me here or it, reach out to your local extension office. I can go ahead and I'll pop this link into the chat for you guys to look at. And if there's um, any questions at all, you guys can reach out to your local county agents that are near to you. With that, I'm going to stop my share. Hi, Carol, I actually, I have a question for you. Okay. Okay, so mm -hmm. I did buy a couple of these pumpkins, so I'm just gonna bring them over. Mm -hmm. All right, so this one, this one, I've, I've just carved out the top, put some flowers in it, but this is not a pie pumpkin. This is a decorative pumpkin mm -hmm. then? Yeah. So the, the, this would not have a good flavor for eating. It might, I'm not really sure from that, just looking at it, I'm, I'm really talking about those big, huge ones that you get like out in the front that are just, um, they're okay. a specific variety grown just for carving. And uh -huh. so they have pretty poor flesh, like their flesh is more mealy and it's just not as good for um, cooking. But that okay. one may be okay. It, it may be just a, a decorative variety or it may be a pie pumpkin that just is, a, is pretty. So it might be okay. Okay. Hard right. to tell. Be fun to <laughs> well, I love the part part about carving the turnips. I know. <laughs> I think that's it's, great. It, it just seems like a lot of work for. Uh, yeah, it does sound like a lot of work. I also found I love the term the three sisters: the corn, the beans, and the squash. I've never heard that before. What a fantastic way to describe those! Great. All right. Any comments or questions? All right, Valerie, I think it's your show. So um, All right. go ahead and you know, get Great. ready to get started. I will let everybody know, thank you for joining us. We will be doing our quizzes or our little trivia throughout. Um, so while Valerie is getting set up, I have one for you. So pumpkins were grown by Native Americans, true or false? You can put your answers in the chat and what we've done every cooking demo is once we get those winners, um, as Valerie sends out a little basket um, to those that actually get all of our questions right. So the question again is pumpkins were grown by Native Americans, true or false? All right, Ms. Valerie, take it away. Okay, all right, while you're thinking about that one, it's a 50-50 chance, so <laughs> go for it there. Okay, part of what um, Lashika and I were discussing a couple of months ago about this program was not only to highlight some fall foods, which we're going to be doing today, but also to um, intertwine some ideas and suggestions for reducing calorie intake um, when preparing or eating these recipes that are coming up in the fall, which is normally a high fat, high calorie season, which makes it so enjoyable. Um, but also, uh, I wanted to offer some suggestions today to you about how to reduce 
Um, I'm actually going to talk more about up the fat content because fat contributes the most amount of calories per gram at nine calories per gram as opposed to carbohydrates and, and protein, which are four to four to five grams of, um, cal of calories per gram. So as, as I go through these recipes, I'm going to uh, purposefully talk about the fat content. One of the recipes we're going to start off with today is uh, a pumpkin latte. And many people consume a lot of calories in the beverages that they drink. And coffee is a very popular item. And we've seen the expansion of that market go tremendously. You can get all kinds of coffee right now with lots of additives uh, to them. So I wanted to highlight a recipe today that I'm calling Val's uh, pumpkin latte. We're going to use some spices in it as well, but I've tried to reduce the calorie content of this and also have a very enjoyable beverage. I'll be quite honest with you, I was skeptical about this recipe when I was trying it, but actually it's really good. So it's not a true latte that you might get in one of the local stores um, out on the street, but uh, give it a try. I think you might enjoy it. So what we're going to do is we're going to make um, sort of a maple syrup concoction that actually has puree, a uh, pumpkin puree in it, not can, not pie filling, but actual puree pumpkin, which you can find. Um, so we're going to combine a couple of ingredients in here and then uh, we cook it on the stove and have a little mixture. So we're going to start off by adding uh, the maple syrup. Now you can use maple syrup if you want to in here. I tried two recipes. I wanted to further cut down the calorie content. So in, I also tried using just a light pancake syrup, which works really well. Um, so that's another way to reduce the calorie content. So we're just actually going to add the maple syrup or the pancake syrup right into the pan. And from that point, it's just a matter of putting all the ingredients together in here. So we've got pumpkin, this is pureed pumpkin. It's just canned, this is canned pureed pumpkin here. If you don't use all of your pumpkin, put it in a plastic bag and freeze it. It'll keep for a couple of months at least and you can use it in other items like baking muffins or breads. Add it to stir fries if you want to, or sauces to give it sort of a fall flavor to it. You can also use fruits as a replacement for oil in baking goods. I'm not, I, I'm not an expert in this area and I've used it a couple of times, but what I would suggest that you do is when you're making something like a muffin or a bread, is that look, Google using applesauce as an oil replacement or applesauce, it could also replace the eggs in the product. Um, it won't work all the time, but that's another way to cut back on the amount of fat and the calories that are going to be incorporated into that recipe and adding a lot of nutrients as well. Applesauce is normally used because it's sort of a blander type ingredient. It'll add the um, consistency to the product without adding a whole lot of extra flavor. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're baking. All right, to this, we're just gonna add the vanilla extract as well. And I've got three spices here. Um, this is just cinnamon. Pop that right on top. That's a perfect spice for the fall. This is ground ginger, another beautiful spice. It goes very well with pumpkins. Gonna just pour that in there. And for this last spice, I wanted to demonstrate something to you. And I also want to encourage you to begin to use spices and herbs, and hopefully get to talk a little bit about that in, in just a little bit more. Um, and don't be afraid of them. Start common spices and integrate them into your cooking. I think you'll find them as a great way to cut down on fats or salt and incorporate a lot of antioxidants. These spices are packed with antioxidants and nutrients as well. But I wanted to show you about this, how to add, this recipe also has cloves in it. I'm sorry, not cloves, nutmeg. You could put cloves in it, that's for sure. So these are little nutmegs. They're just the, the whole nutmeg instead of buying the ground nutmeg in the store. This is an alternative. You can buy these nutmegs, as they're in the same spice section. They keep forever. I just put them in a jar like this and I keep them in my spice cabinet. But this is a way to actually grind your own spice and grind as much as you need rather than buying the spice in the can. So I'm simply going to take a small grater and the nutmeg 
and just grind it up against the smaller portion, the, the, the finer part of the grater. The aroma that comes out of this is fantastic, especially if you like fall spices, the cloves, just in the nutmeg. I love all of those things. Cinnamon. Okay. So I've just grated it on a paper towel because that's the easiest way to grate it. And I'm just gonna pop it in here. Just shake it in. Okay, from this point, all we do is give it a stir. I promise you, you're gonna love the smell of this. <laughs> Nothing else is gonna fill the house like a pumpkin, pumpkin pie or an apple pie. Okay, so you wanna put this in a sort of a heavier saucepan and I've just mixed those together. I pop it on the stove in a, over a medium heat for about 10 minutes and give it a couple of stirs and you'll see that this begins to thicken, okay? And let it do that, let it get really thick and then take it off the stove and let it cool, okay? So that's as complicated as that gets, which is not very complicated. And then I wanted to show you what this actually looks like. You get a mixture like this. This is, I made this yesterday, so it's even gelled a little bit more. And again, this mixture I made with the light pancake syrup. Okay. Now that's the flavoring, the pumpkin spice flavoring that we're going to add. So you simply, I'm going to take a mug. <laughs> I'm going to add about a tablespoonful of this. To the cup. I warmed this coffee this morning, but it's not, I, can't, I have a hard time keeping everything hot here, but uh, you're just going to add espresso coffee to this, which is what I did. I didn't add a shot of espresso. I just made espresso uh, coffee. You could put any kind of coffee flavor if you wanted to in this. You could brew a uh, pumpkin pie coffee right now or a hazelnut coffee and add this to it. So you just simply add that, a little bit of that, about an ounce, but to your preference, however you like it. And then to that, I would just add the skim milk. And again, this is a way to cut down on the fat content by just adding skim milk and not adding whole milk to it. Just give it a stir. All those ingredients will meld together and the aroma will be fantastic when it comes out of here. Okay, I'm gonna add one more thing to it, but I have to grab it out of the freezer. <laughs> okay, here's a reduction in the fat content that I was talking about. Most of the calories coming in through these lattes are coming in through a lot of the sugar that's being added to the syrups. So we've cut that down by using uh, a light pancake syrup. But the other addition is through the fat content. All of the whipped toppings that they add are so creamy and so delicious, and they're usually whole fat products. So I was trying to think of another product that might be suitable for a latte. So I'm just gonna pop this on here and pop that on top. This is a cocoa whip that I've used. You can use, there are several different brands of these out uh, in, the, in the grocery stores. This is a frozen product. So this is a plant-based product which has, it, a little less than half the calories of um, a regular whipped topping. And if you were to use even heavy cream, it, it would probably be a fourth of those calories in here. This product can be incorporated into many of the recipes where you would use half and half or a, or a whipped type of full dairy product. It's really creamy, it's, it's a good product. I, I hadn't used it before, so I was, again, a bit skeptical, but I have tried it and it's a really good substitution. So there's a way to cut down on the amount of calories in your spice latte, your beverage. Normally these beverages can have anywhere from, at a minimum, 300 calories normally if you get them out, depending on what size you have. 
up to 350, 400 calories in them, which is a lot to take in for just a beverage. So this can actually get down to around 200 calories, 240 calories. And if you're using the pancake mix, like the pancake syrup, like I did, probably down to about 190. So enjoy your spice latte with a little bit less fat content in it. It's full of flavor. It's still got a ton of antioxidants in it. And it's a great way to use the flavor of uh, fall. So I hope you'll enjoy that. I'm going to swap out the ingredients and we're gonna get started on a really crunchy treat of granola that you can use in a variety of different ways. Over to you for questions. All right, so we, we, don't, we have a couple questions, but most of it is just saying, hmm, I think it smells good. I want one now. Um, <laughs> David wants to know how you grate that nut like that and not grate your fingers into the mix. <laughs> <laughs> That might be a David issue and not anybody else, but well, <laughs> that takes practice. I did do that, and occasionally I do if I'm not paying attention or if the nut gets really too small, um, you will nick your fingers. So just be careful. There are other graders out there. You don't have to use that, but I try. I'm multi-purposing here using this. I didn't want a special piece of equipment. There was some options in the chat about different pumpkin recipes. Uh, like a pumpkin swirl brownie, Lauren mentioned, or cheesecake bars, um, using that pumpkin puree for. And then Ashley wants to know, does chocolate and pumpkin pair well? And the comments are, chocolate goes with everything. <laughs> yeah. I like that answer. <laughs> All right, get ready for some crunch. All right, our next Trivia question while she's getting ready with that. California grows the most pumpkins in the US, true or false? California grows the most pumpkins in the US, true or false? So if you were on our call early, uh, Carol talked about the place that grew the most. And just as a bonus, can anybody just tell us where is that place? Because it is false. California is not the location, <laughs> but does anybody know? Illinois, we had some listeners out there. All right. We had some listeners, that's fantastic. Yay. <laughs> All right, I think Miss Valerie is ready to show us how to make this yummy granola bar. Okay, so get ready to have some crunch and some versatility with this recipe. Most of these ingredients that you're, you're gonna see here are very purposeful. And I cook with oatmeal a lot. I use a lot of oatmeal because it's such a great grain to use. It has such versatility in it. It's packed with nutrients, packed with fiber. It's antioxidant. It's cardiovascular benefits to it. So it's just one of those, to me, it's one of those perfect plant foods to be able to use. And it pairs well with a lot of different ingredients. Okay, so today we're gonna to be making a cranberry and apple pie granola. And the ingredients are just old fashioned oats, not the quick cooking oats, but just use old fashioned oats like that. Very economical to buy, especially if you buy them in the very large containers like I do. We're going to use dried cranberries. And I know you can remember from previous talks that we've had that these are full of polyphenols and phytonutrients and antioxidants. So the deeper, the darker, the fruit or vegetable, the more powerful the nutrients are within that. So you can't get much deeper and darker and red than cranberries in here. We're also going to use some dried apple rings in this today. And all I've done is chop these up. These are unsweetened. All of this fruit is unsweetened. Um, we're, again, we're gonna be using cinnamon, nutmeg, a little bit of maple syrup, and I substituted the pancake syrup in for this recipe as well. One of, the, one of the things you'll learn when you're cooking is that you'll, the more you cook, the more you learn how to modify recipes. And it's just a matter of testing the recipes and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And, and sometimes it, it, it works out fine, just like life, and sometimes it doesn't, but you just try it again. And so that's the fun and experiment uh, of cooking. So I hope you'll, you'll do that and enjoy that. We're also gonna use vanilla extract. We're going to use a little bit of canola oil or another vegetable oil if we like. You can add salt to this if you want to. You don't have to, that's a preference. We're going to also incorporate some nuts. We're going to use pecans and we're also going to use pepitas, which are whole squash seeds. So another seasonal way to use these as well. 
pretty simple recipe. We just actually put everything in the bowl. So let's start doing that. So I'm gonna dump in the oats. Add the spices to it. You can see this. Can you see this? Okay. Perfect. Okay. I'm just going to add just a little bit of salt, not much. The cranberries. Apples. A little bit of vanilla extract. You could also use another kind of extract if you want to. If you wanted to use almond extract, that would be good. You could use walnut extract. That's something you could play with. I'm adding just a little bit of oil. And that is just to keep this mixture together and make it sort of like clusters so that it all comes together. We're not using a lot of it, which is, which is good. So we're mindful of the fat content here. We're gonna add the pepitas straight in there and the pecans. Okay, so we've just got a bowl full of goodness. To that, we're gonna drizzle on the syrup. You could also, if you wanted to use honey with this, you could use that as well. You could use a combination of honey and syrup. All right, and that's it. We're just gonna coat it really well. A little baking hint for you here, a little mixing hint for you here. When you're putting together ingredients like this and you have sticky and oily together, you're going to find that it, it sticks to the spoon. What you might want to do is spray the spoon with a little bit of a cooking spray so that you don't have everything stuck to it. But I wanted to show you how it works first <laughs> to give you that hint. It's not too bad, but sometimes if you have a lot of stickiness in these recipes, uh, you'll end up scraping the spoon off to get all the goodness. All right. Okay. The next part is just to put it on a baking dish and I lined this baking dish with parchment paper. You could also just spray the baking dish if you wanted to with a spray and dump it on. This is not a particularly sweet granola. A lot of granola that you will buy or purchase in the stores and even in cereals is very sweet. And if you look at the ingredient label, you'll probably find that sugar is close to the top on the ingredient list. So remember when you're reading an ingredient label, what's, what's listed first on the ingredient list is what's most in that product. And then after that, it's in descending order. So if you pick up something, a product, and it has salt, sugar, Fat shortening is listed as one of the first three ingredients in it. You're, you'll, you, you'll know from that that that's what the majority of the ingredient is in that recipe. In this particular recipe, we, we don't have that as an ingredient. The major ingredient in this recipe is oats, which is always a good sign. Okay, so when I was practicing with this recipe, the original recipe said to cook this for about 10 minutes and stir it. But what I found was that it wasn't crunchy enough. I wanted a real crunch to this granola. So I lengthened the, the cooking time by actually 20 minutes at 10 minute intervals. So put it in the oven, low, it's low, this is gonna be low and slow. You're gonna allow this to cook like this. One other hint for this. If you do not allow enough space in between all of this granola, you'll actually be steaming the product instead of baking the product, okay, and getting it crispy. So you wanna make sure that you spread it out really well so that every little area has uh, ability to reach the heat and it, and it uh, penetrates it rather than just steaming against one another. So that's what you'll do in, thir in 10 minute increments, you'll do that for uh, three times and then just let it cool. Okay, and now here comes the fun part. We get to find out what we're gonna do with this. So I've got a few examples back here. Okay, one is just to eat it as a granola, right? You could just put it out and have it served as a granola like that, of course, with a spoon for people, especially if you have other people over. Another idea is to package it up and use it as a Christmas gift. <laughs> it's perfect. 
just put it in a little jar, tie a ribbon around it, and you're good to go with that. It's also a great way to keep it handy at home. The other way is to tie it up and take it as a snack. This is a great snacking item to have. Put it in a plastic bag, portion the products out to about a half a cup, and you're good to go with a snack there. But that's not all you can do with this product. This has uh, two more applications to it. One is to eat it, well actually three more applications to it. One is to eat it with uh, just a, uh, a dollop of Greek yogurt. Okay, so that's another very high, this is a very high protein product. It's lower in fat, use the low fat and add cinnamon or nutmeg to this, spice it up. Don't be afraid to use your spices. Use, add little cloves to it if you want to, okay? And pop it right on top of the granola and have it mix it in, perfect. The other two options, one is just to pour cold milk over, over this, or it could be a plant-based milk, it could be a dairy milk, it doesn't matter, and then you have a cold cereal. This is just like the granola that you buy in the package for breakfast cereal. All right. Option number three for winter, pour the milk over here and pop it in the microwave for a couple of, maybe two minutes, but maybe stopping it about every 30 seconds, 35 seconds and give it a stir. And that way you'll have a creamy hot cereal for breakfast. It's really packed full of protein, especially if you're adding the milk to it. And then dollop it with yogurt as well. So this recipe, although it starts out as a granola, can also be used as a hot cereal. Um, as, as a snack and as a cold cereal as well. So I hope you'll try this out. Be creative with it. Add your own mixed fruit to it. Change it up. Add some raisins to it. Dried figs, dried prunes. Um, you be creative with your recipe. Okay, anything about that one? All right, I'm gonna touch on one last thing. I'm gonna give me some time to swap out. All right, so we, in the chat, we just talked about there's lots of suggestions and I appreciate that instead of just eating it regular, that you have lots of ways to eat the granola, homemade grow, granola. I do like the tip, Ms. Valerie, you gave about the ingredients, the most ingredients is at the top of the list. So I don't know about y'all, but I will be noting that in the future while we're growing grocery shopping to check out those labels. All right, our next question. Pumpkins grown for food are typically harvested by hand. True or false? Pumpkins grown for food are typically harvested by hand. True or false? All right, answers are coming in. Correct. It is false. It is false. We're, I'm loving these pumpkin questions. Y'all, y'all really paid attention to Miss Carol in her. Uh, and her PowerPoint, that was fantastic. All right, I think Valerie is ready to, I think we're gonna talk about some herbs right now. We are, we are, again. So I'm gonna circle back around to what I said in the opening. And I, I started to think about Southern cooking and how much we like to have flavorful foods, if you will, collard greens and turnip greens and our meats. We traditionally use here in the South, a lot of fat back or lard or fatty bacon, fatty meats, if you will, to flavor our vegetables. And although that, that is delicious to use, it's not really all that hard healthy. And so I wanted to, to offer you some other tips about how to flavor these vegetables, soups, stews, um, chilies, bean mixtures, without adding a lot more fat to the product. In some instances, you can keep this totally plant-based if you want to do that. So I want to introduce being able to use herbs and spices. And I talked a little bit about this when I was just preparing the last two recipes. Don't be afraid to use herbs and spices. Go over to the spice cabinet in the, in the grocery store and make friends with that area, as well as all of the fresh herbs that are over in the, the market section, the cold uh, produce section of the market and begin to experiment and incorporate these. So we're trying to reduce the fat content when we're adding, uh, when we're adding spices. That's, what, that's the reason behind this. So I wanted to show you uh, one little hint on how to create your own at home, which is a little bit fun to do. 
Valerie, we do have a question. What is sure. the difference between an herb and a spice? I knew you were going to, I knew that was going to come up. I... <laughs> <laughs> that was David. <laughs> okay. I don't really know. <laughs> I was just about to look that up before we started and I got distracted. I knew you were going to ask that, but you'll have to Google it. Why don't you Google it while I'm talking and you can give me the answer. <laughs> I, I just know that I use both of them readily in the kitchen and I'm not quite sure whether herbs are just live or dried or what. But anyway, maybe somebody can look at that while I'm doing this. I do know that we're going to incorporate both of these in these little cheesecloths I'm going to make. Um, okay, so we're just going to make a little sachet here uh, product. And the only thing you need is a, this is a piece of muslin fabric that I had. I could not find any cheesecloth yesterday. You can also use um, gauze if you want to, although you'll have to layer the gauze a couple of times. So we're actually going to use this to wrap some herbs and spices in, and then I'll show you how to drop it inside of a, a, a pot. All right, so what I've done is I've just put on top of the muslin, I've just had a cinnamon stick, this is star anise, and these are a few cloves. And this type of mixture could be used in if you're making any type of apple cider, like for Halloween and you wanted an, an extra spice to it. It actually could be a mulling spice as well. I'm just gonna snap the cinnamon stick so it fits inside. You can see this. I'm going to just take this, this is a four inch square. I'm going to take it and fold it like a triangle, like that, and then just simply gather it up. This is an 18 inch piece of string right here. Just regular common string. I'm just going to tie it around the bag. I'm just going to cinch the bag. Like that. Okay, and then that, then you simply tie that to the handle of the pot. You don't have to, if you have a handle on a pot, it's a great way to do that. And then when you're filling the pot with your stock and your vegetables and things like that, just drop it in. Okay, and at the end of when you're finished cooking, just take it out and you can discard it. Okay, if you want, you can use the muslin. If you're using muslin, you can use the fabric again. You just need to wash it. One little safety tip, you want to keep this string very short, the one that you tied onto the pot, because you do not want it to go into the source of the heat, like the fire or the electric burner if you have it. So just make sure that that stays quite short, okay? And that's is pretty easy to do, and it's fun. So I just, another idea for soups and stews would be to take fresh herbs. This is fresh thyme. I have in here, an herb. <laughs> and <laughs> this is something I didn't know about this and I've been throwing these away for years and, I, and I've just now realized what I've been doing. This recipe that you have in front of you calls for the stems of, I use cilantro in here because I didn't have parsley stems. So the stems, which I didn't realize have a lot of flavor themselves, uh, for how many years I've been throwing those away. All right, I won't be doing that anymore. And these are just bay leaves. So these are, this is a really good way to season stews and you make your own mixture, whatever you want in here to flavor your beans or peas or your stew or your casserole. Think about these before you add anything like oil or fat. And I think you'll get the seasonings in here. This is also, all of this are sodium free. So if you're, if sodium is a concern um, that you need to lower the sodium content, this is a great way to do this. One more hint about seasoning uh, meats or vegetables. When you're cooking something like a turkey or a chicken or beef or pork or whatever the meat is, and this is for those who are consuming meat, save the juice that comes off of the meat, pour it, into a glass container, like a glass measuring cup, and put it in the refrigerator and let the fat rise to the top. You'll see it. it's the creamy white layer on top. Skim that off and throw it away. And the juice that's left over in that measuring cup, 
pour it into an ice cube tray and freeze it. And that way you can season your vegetables and your stews and your beans with that seasoning cube that you've, that you've developed without the fat content. So it's sort of like a replacement for a bouillon cube. When you're cooking chickens and turkeys and, and those types of, of meat, really season them really well, and that way you'll get a rich, rich broth that you can use later on, and it's a handy way to season like that. Okay, that's the end of what I have for you today. Can I entertain any questions? Thank you, Valerie. Do we have any questions? You can unmute if you would like and ask them. Um, we did get some responses on your on the question herb and spice. Um, <laughs> so we've got from Google, um, herbs and spices come from plants, but herbs are the fresh part of the plants, while spice is the dried root, the dried stalk, seed, or the dried fruit of the Perfect. plant, okay. and is almost always dried, not fresh. And so that's pretty much what. Um, Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. And then someone said the examples of herbs include basil, oregano, thyme, rosemary, parsley, and mint. So. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Good stuff. Well, I know that I've learned some things about creating these little cloths and dropping them in <laughs> and um, not throwing away the chicken stock or the turkey stock or whatever that is <laughs> so that you have. Do don't throw it away and use it. So that's awesome. Any questions for Valerie or for Carol? Because she's still on the on the call with us today. All right. Well, if you ever have any questions, you feel free to reach out to Valerie or myself. Uh, we'll appreciate everything. We do have one last trivia question. And I'm not sure uh, how many of y'all were paying attention, but we'll see. How many egg whites can substitute for one egg in a recipe? That, yeah, that was actually in the written section. <laughs> Two. Yeah, look at that. All right. Perfect. Good job. Good Perfect. Job. And then name two ingredients in the herbs de Provence recipe. Two ingredients. Anybody know two of the ingredients? Basil and bay leaf. Perfect. Cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> All of those would be great herbs, your Provence, to be able to use. Yes, good stuff. Good. Well, we appreciate everyone participating in our trivia. Celery and fennel. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Great. And we will be getting in contact with our winners and getting them their swag <laughs> that Valley comes in. Okay, with. I look forward to that. Thank y'all so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and happy cooking with pumpkin. Yes. Thanks again to Carol Stringer. And don't forget, you guys, wash your hands. <laughs> Have a good one. See you next time. Bye. Thanks, Valerie. Oh, you're welcome, Dave.